Hey everyone, uh, getting started here. I'm using a little bit of a new setup, so apologies if uh, things are a little weird. But let's, uh, hello. Make sure everybody can see and hear me before we get started um, so that the recording is good to go. But welcome to um, the elementary monthly stream. Today the plan is to look at some flat pack stuff and then do some Q&A. Um, going to be pretty free form, so not really super um, formal or anything. So can everybody in the comments hear me all right? Let me pull up the comments, actually. That would be helpful uh, in the live chat. Hey, uh, JH, chill out in the live chat a little bit, maybe. <laughs> uh, I think I saw Dan in here earlier. Hello, hello. Um, hi, everybody. Oh, wow, there's... Uh, it's a good number of people here, 47, 47 people. Um, Ka Kala or Kaya, I can't quite see the name, um, asks, uh, there's only one issue left on the beta tracker. I'm gonna actually pull that up. So will elementary OS 6 beta be released when that is complete? And um, yes, <laughs> we're, uh, we're real close here. So let's go to, uh, let's see, what am I doing? GitHub, good way to start the stream. Elementary, oh my gosh, I can't type. Elementary, and let's go to our projects. So anybody can uh, do this, it's public on the internet. So you can go to github.com slash elementary, go to projects and look at the elementary OS six, where did it go? Just use search. There we go. Look at the elementary OS 6 board or uh, github.com slash orgs slash elementary slash projects slash 55. And uh, let's see here. Yes, I am running elementary OS 6, somebody is asking. Um, so yeah, this is the project board. Uh, public beta has one last issue here and this might actually be a little bit out of date um, based on a conversation we had last night but um yes this is effectively the the last issue before the beta so we have to get the flat pack repository added to the operating system by default so that any app updates get pushed out to users uh, through the flat pack repo so that's some of some of what i'm going to talk about in demo today too so it'll be related to that but yeah check out the uh, project board see all the stuff we've done and then this release candidate column is things that still need to be done before like the actual stable release. So yeah, that's uh, that's that. Can everybody hear me okay? Is that nice and clear, somebody said. I'll take it. We can hear you and see you. I sound good. Cool, I'm using a new microphone. I got a, a Shure SM58. It was actually my grandpa's. Um, he was a country singer and it works well for streaming as well, apparently. So that's, that's kind of fun, very different use case. I'm also using a new light and I look extra shiny, so I'm sorry. I'm just all out of whack today. Um, but yeah, let's talk about Flatpak. So um, Flatpak has been around since at least 2015. I think a few years before that it was actually started. Uh, we attended the West Coast Hack Fest in 2015, where um, at the time I think it was called XDG App. Um, but we worked with um, some GTK and GNOME developers there, and they kind of showed us what the future of apps on Linux-based operating systems was going to look like. Um, and, you know, at the time, it was pretty conceptual to us. Um, they were working on it, but we hadn't really dug into it much. And over the last six years now, um, we've really, um, I guess, investigated it. We've took, taken a look at other platform or other um, technologies like Snap, and we've really settled in on Flatpak as like the future of, of app distribution and both for third parties and for first parties on elementary OS. So with any new technology, there's of course going to be um, FUD out there uh, and, you know, misinformation and whatnot. So on Twitter, a lot of people have been asking about, um, you know, oh, but what about this thing that I've heard about Flatpak? What about this thing, that thing? Um, so I can cover some of those right off the bat here. So the first one, the, the number one thing I think people say about Flatpak is, oh, apps are huge. They take up so much more space, which is, um, it has, it has like a grain of truth. Um, you know, it, it's coming from a place of truth, but it really 
is not the case, especially when you're um, an operating system like elementary OS, where you're shipping flat packs out of the box on the operating system. So the reason people say that they're big is if you've never installed a flat pack before, which was the case of many people over the last several years, um, and you say, I want, you know, let's say I want a calculator app. The way flat pack works is it has run times. And these run times are basically an entire operating system. And apps are then built on top of those run times. And so they're only, you know, the app is still a tiny little app, but that runtime has to be downloaded at some point. So if it's the first time you've ever installed a flat pack, yeah, it's going to download a few hundred megabytes of a runtime, which seems like that's outrageous. I just wanted one app. And then if you're on an operating system where you're downloading a KDE app and a GNOME app and an elementary OS app and an Electron app, those are all built using different runtimes, which means they do have to download for the first, the first time you install an app from that platform it has to download and install that runtime. So at a glance, yeah, it looks like, wow, these are you know, hundreds of megabytes are huge, whatever. There's a few cool, cool things about this though, actually. First of all, files are deduplicated between those runtimes. So there's something called the free desktop runtime. That's like, it's kind of like the uh, Linux system base. It's, it's like a, it's a level playing field that contains all the core Linuxy stuff that apps will need. And then runtimes like the KDE runtime and GNOME runtimes are built on top of the free desktop runtime. So when you download you know, a KDE runtime and a, a GNOME runtime, any shared files between those are deduplicated. So you're not downloading duplicate files. And when they're stored on disk, they're deduplicated as well. Um, so that's one cool thing is the deduplication of the platforms themselves or the runtimes themselves. And then... The other cool thing is when you have an operating system like elementary OS, we're shipping the platform runtime as part of the operating system. So you never have to download it. So when you download a calculator app, you're just downloading the calculator app. So it's, you know, just a few kilobytes or whatever, however big that would be. Um, and I'll do a, I can do a little demo of that later too. Let me get some water. I <coughs> have a dry throat. So yeah, that's, that's the big thing about size um, as far as flat pack apps. So it, it's coming from a place of people are seeing, yes, it looks like there is, you know, these huge download sizes, but in reality, um, it's not actually an issue, especially with elementary OS. Um, let's see. Oh, and even app files are deduplicated on disk. So that's actually really cool. Like, let's say um, one app you include, your one app you install includes a certain icon that doesn't come from the system set. And then another app includes that icon. That file, that icon file, is deduplicated across those two apps. So there's, you know, people say, oh, everybody bundles all of their uh, dependencies in the Flatpak apps. First of all, it's not true because of the runtimes. Dependencies don't have to be bundled. They're part of the runtime. Second of all, if they do uh, bundle a dependency that's not in the runtime, it gets deduplicated if that dependency exists anywhere else. So it's a really cool technology. It's built on top of um, OS tree, which is basically like Git for operating systems and apps. Um, it uses like a Git-based, a Git-style um, branches and trees and, and objects and uh, way over my head as far as how it actually works technically. But I know it's it's the same way that um, Git files are deduplicated is the way uh, Flatpak files are deduplicated. So that's a lot of rambling about uh, the size issue of Flatpaks, which is not actually an issue. Um, yeah, so... Oh, and that's, so on elementary OS, a specific point of that is um, all of our first party apps are going to be built with the elementary platform and uh, third party apps in App Center will also be built against that same runtime. So you're not going to get the case where like on FlatHub where you download an app, it might be built against, you know, GNOME 338 and then a different app might be built against KDE whatever and then a different app might be built against free desktop with a whole bunch of Electron stuff. On elementary OS, they'll all be built against the elementary runtime. Um, let's see. So then the other major thing, um, security, privacy, uh, and sandboxing is kind of the whole point of Flatpak. Like, um, there's the... <laughs> Flatpak apps are run in sandboxes, and they have to use a very specific defined API is called portals to reach out from that sandbox and talk to the, the greater operating system or other apps. Um, and this includes things like uh, camera access, location access, even file access to other files, um, screen recording, uh, audio recording, 
those all use portals and the operating system implements the portals. So elementary OS six implements these portals. Um, and there's a, there's a, like free desktop portals that are a backup or a, a fallback runtime or fallback portal implementation. Um, and this ensures that the user is in control of their privacy. So when an app wants to access their camera, they can choose whether they want to allow it or not. It's really similar to what you see on mobile operating systems today, where um, apps have to define what permissions they want, and then there's runtime permissions that actually are on demand, um, and you can approve those things. And there's also portals are also used for things behind the scenes where you don't ever see like a dialog pop up, but it just enforces um, the security and privacy policy that we already implement today. Um, and so this is, the technology of Flatpak is in addition to what Elementary is already doing. So we're already um, doing first party reviews of our apps. So every app update is reviewed by multiple people on the Elementary um, repositories. And then it goes through another review when it goes to be released. Um, and then it's released to users. So that helps ensure that our first party apps aren't doing bad things. And with third party apps for App Center, um, it's, it's a similar process where Developers submit their apps. They're reviewed by a panel of um, elementary volunteers and employees, and we ensure that they're you know following best practices. They're not doing anything bad about privacy. Um, we ensure that when they say that they you know need certain features for certain reasons, that they're actually being used that way, um, and that they're like um, there's the open age ratings service, which is basically tells you about the content of the app and we, we ensure that that content matches, um, that, that, that rating matches what the content actually is. So we're already doing that human review. Plus there's automated reviews that run. Um, and then the sandboxing of Flatpak helps us actually enforce that policy at a technical level. So it's kind of both sides. We we're reviewing the apps when they're submitted and we're enforcing it at the technical level. Um, which I think is a, is a good combination. So I'm going to look, I've talked a lot about the size and uh, security privacy and sandboxing stuff. I'm going to take a look at the comments here and see what people have. I did not set up my uh, live chat in a good way where it's easy to read. So I'm sorry about all of the awkward side viewing and scrolling through stuff. So, um, Matthias, I think is how you pronounce your name. Um, <laughs> he asked, uh, "Do people think that asking when it will re re be released makes it makes development go faster?" Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we should, you know, we have the classic response of when it's ready. As far as you know, when is when is it coming out? When it's ready? Um, I feel like we should have a different response for that. Of like, you know, oh well, you just added one more day onto the the uh, future release date that we haven't set yet. Somebody else said most asked question will be the ETA and it'll be followed by people lecturing the people who talked about it. It'll be fun watching that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we all know how that goes. Thanks for playing along, I guess. Um, let's see. When did the broadcast start? Well, yeah, it started. Um, flat pack port progress. So yeah. So specifically we'll get into that in a little bit after this little Q and a I'll demo some flat pack stuff for you. So it won't just me bl be blabbing at the uh, camera the whole time. I promise. All right. Sound volume is very low. Was that the, um, was that the music beforehand? I think that was probably the music. If not, I can see if I can up the microphone, but it looks on my side, it looks like it's good. Um, people saying they can hear me. Hello, hello, hello. Whoa, all the chat just reloaded. Okay, that's cool. Thanks, YouTube. Um, what is the advantage of Flatpak over Snap? So that's a good question. Um, we wrote a blog post about this. Let me uh pull that up. But basically, um, too many apps installed. Blog. Basically, the big thing is the decentralized nature of Flatpak as a technology itself. So um, Snap requires you to use Canonical's Snap Store, um, Snap Craft Store, I forget which it's called, um, in order to, you know, out of the box. You could recompile Snap to point to a different store or something, but out of the box, it all depends on Canonical's Snap Store. 
So for us, we want to host our own Flatpak repository. Um, let me... Yeah, here we go. Uh, blog.elementary.io slash elementary dash app center dash flatpak. That is the, uh, that's the one you want to read. But yeah, cover it in here about why not insert format here. Um, decentralized is definitely, the neighbors are um, doing something upstairs. I was loud, sorry. Uh, decentralized by design. So we can host our own remote. We have full control over that. We can do things like ensure that all apps and enforce by design that all apps are built on um, our our runtime and not just all sorts of random things. Um, we can approve or even reject apps if you know if it's a very clear copyright violation. We can just not accept it into the store if it's a um, very clear like crypto miner that's pretending to be a sticker app or whatever um we can reject that from the store so we're we're in control of that experience which is um really a, a core like probably the most important thing about um how it has to operate so flatpak is built that way from the start you know they have flat hub as a kind of de facto fallback store that they encourage people to use but anybody can spin up a remote like we're doing with the app center remote so yeah um and also, yeah, it's more closely aligned with our stack. So people who are working on GNOME and GTK are also heavily involved in Flatpak. Flatpak is not a GNOME technology by any means. Uh, it's more under the free desktop banner. But it's the same people working on those core pieces of the stack. Um, whereas a lot of the people working on Snap aren't necessarily the ones working on GTK and um, GNOME technologies. So it's more closely aligned with our interests in our stack. And it's much easier for us to work with those people um, to improve it. And then consensus from indie app developers. Um, this is a big one. Um, because of, in large part, due to FlatHub, um, the indie app developer ecosystem on the Linux desktop has pretty much universally adopted Flatpak as the preferred means of distribution. So um, Snap seems to be really interested in courting like large, um, large tech giants. Like they have some Microsoft and Google things that they advertise on their site. Um, we're more interested in the indie app developer side. Um, we think that's where the growth is, and that's where the more interesting ideas come from. And Flatpak is more closely aligned with that, with those interests as well. So, yeah, there's a whole bunch I get more into it um, and talk about dev packages and stuff in this blog post. So, highly encourage you to take a look at that blog.elementary.io slash elementary dash app center dash Flatpak. Look at me using that new multi touch gesture for Zoom. That's so nice. By the way, we merged some new multi-touch stuff lately. It was really nice. So yeah, that's uh, that's the deal with Flatpak versus Snap. Um, and somebody said, oh, I didn't know. Apps shipped in elementary OS are Flatpaks. Well, that's a deal breaker. Um, why? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's a technical Im implementation detail. Um, uh, users will never know as far as when they're using apps. Um, and because of all the reasons I talked about before about the size and security um, improvements, it's really a, a good deal. Another part of that size thing, um, with Debian packages, when you download an update, you have to download a copy of the entire app as an update. So even if you just change like one little string, one little word in your app or one little icon or fixed one tiny little bug, um, every time you update it, you have to download the entire app uh, with a Debian package. Whereas with Flatpak, you just download the difference. So you just download that tiny little change and it applies it on top of the existing app. Um, again, much more like um, Git, how Git works, if you're familiar with that. So um, yeah, diff-based updates are awesome. It's a huge, huge improvement. Um, and, and when it's, you know, all the apps work that way, um, pieces of the platform work that way, it, it's, it's a much better system. So let's see. Somebody mentioned App Center became empty after a recent update. Is that because of the flat pack transition? So if you're talking about um, on Elementary OS 6, um, App Center, yes, sort of. So uh, in Elementary OS 6, we made a decision that... Um, with the addition of Flatpak and with the great support of um, sideloading apps via like FlatHub, uh, App Center is really being focused on App Center apps. So instead of showing the 
decades of legacy apps that half of them or more are broken or don't integrate well in elementary OS um, coming from the Ubuntu repos. App Center is focused on Flatpak apps and then obviously core um, Debian packages from elementary OS as well. So yeah, if you go to now, this will be a little weird because I I've installed a third party app, probably OBS or something from uh, FlatHub. So I'm actually seeing FlatHub apps in App Center because they're flat packs. Um, and so it's it's showing alongside your normal apps here. So yeah, as soon as you install a FlatHub app, you get all of the FlatHub apps in App Center, as you'd expect. Um, and it really will fill up App Center again if you're looking for that like kind of a third party non curated um, app experience, I guess. So yeah, and then as um, as apps are as App Center apps are ported for Elementary OS six, there'll be flat packs that'll show up in App Center as you'd expect. Um, just like in Elementary OS five, they'll just be flat packs under the hood instead of Debian packages, which won't really make a difference to your daily use. Okay, let's see. If Ubuntu for some reason stopped being maintained, would Elementary switch to Debian? Probably. Um, that's a pretty big hypothetical, though. That's like, you know, if I was hit by a bus tomorrow, how what would we do? I, it would be bad, I'm sure, but um, we'd figure it out. <laughs> so, yeah. And we've, you know, in the long-term future, we've talked about doing an image-based um, operating system, which is kind of the natural extension of doing a flat pack based app ecosystem. Um, I won't get super into that because it's super complicated, but it's really cool. Uh, again, it's more like how mobile operating systems um, and Chrome OS work, uh, where... Uh, instead of installing every package kind of all over the place, you download a diff of the operating system image and it applies that. Um, and then any changes you make are a diff on top of that, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I, Ubuntu does a great job, or Canonical does a great job with Ubuntu with the um, security team and the kernel and device drivers and OEM support and all of that stuff. So um, there's nothing, no compelling reason for us to move away from that today. Um, that's why we picked Ubuntu in the first place. And, you know, if Canonical tomorrow said, hey, yeah, Ubuntu's done, um, yeah, there, there, A, there would probably be a huge community effort to keep Ubuntu or something like it going. And B, yeah, Debian exists, Fedora exists, and that transition to an image-based operating system would probably happen anyway. So, yeah. Interesting question, though. First, somebody is asking, first question, considering Odin will ship with kernel 5.8, are there plans to backport the newer ones down the line, much like Pop! OS is doing to support newer hardware? So Elementary OS actually um, builds on the Ubuntu LTS releases, but we also build on the hardware enablement packages. So that's released um, sometime around the point release, like the, the non-LTS Ubuntu releases. Um, it includes newer kernel, newer drivers i don't know what all it includes it includes hardware enablement things that make your hardware run better or support newer hardware um so we've done that with elementary os 5 we shipped the hardware enablement packages and we're doing the same with elementary os 6 so you get new kernels as they're validated by um, canonical and the ubuntu kernel team da, 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 da. and my chat just reloaded again uh, hey, Micah, how's it going? Uh, Micah asks, will a flat pack future mean that um, third-party apps will not necessarily need to update at the same time as the OS update? So Odin should run fine on elementary next or elementary OS 7 or whatever. Odin apps should run on the next version of elementary OS even before the update. Yes, um, that's another huge advantage of flat pack that I didn't get into yet. Um, the compatibility aspect. So... The cross distribution compatibility aspect is less interesting to us. Um, it's just, it's not the top priority for us, I guess is what I would say. Um, but it does improve the situation where uh, when, you know, elementary OS seven comes out, elementary OS six apps don't have to immediately recompile um, to run on elementary OS seven. They'll still run the OS six version on OS seven. Um, and interestingly, vice versa. Um, so today you can actually run elementary OS six apps on elementary OS five via flat pack, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, let's, why not? This is a good time to transition to that demo. So I've got, uh, got a virtual machine here of elementary OS 5.1 Hera. 
and thanks to some of the awesome work in the community this past couple weeks, um, we have a flat pack remote. So this is going to be pre-installed on elementary OS five or on elementary OS six. Um, but if you're experimental and want to play with it, you can put it on elementary OS five as well, or other distributions like Fedora, Ubuntu, Red Hat, even I think windows subsystem for Linux, maybe I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so here's a little, quick little demo. This is uh, the calculator app in elementary OS five. You can see it's the calculator. It's yep. It's got the button styles that we've got. Uh, it's got, so yeah, look at the suggested action button here. It's this, you know, blue. And then uh, if we say four plus four is eight, then we get the history button here. And you see this little dialogue says value to add, add. Um, so in elementary OS 6, we've been improving calculator and we also are shipping a new style sheet. So I went ahead and added the, uh, let's see, oops. I added the flat pack, uh, flat pack remote for elementary OS 6 to elementary OS 5. And now I can run the calculator from flat pack. And look at that. It's the elementary OS 6 version running on elementary OS 5. So the uh, you can see the destructive button here is a little bit different, a little flatter. The um, suggested action is a little different. It's more of a pastel because it's higher contrast that way. And if we say whatever, we get the history dialog here, which now is a little bit clearer. It has a little bit more um, information and uses better copy. So this is something we just shipped on elementary OS 6, but because I'm running Flatpak on elementary OS 5, I get that app. Um, and it was only a few kilobytes to download, just like you'd expect from Debian, because I had the platform installed already. Um, so any elementary OS 6 apps I install would just be a small update like that. So yeah, that's uh, and it integrates here into the into the um, applications menu as well. Um, if you, that's why I ran it from terminal first, is because this would just run the Flatpak version. Um, it prefers Flatpak over the Debian packages. So yeah, you get uh, elementary OS 6 apps on elementary OS 5. And um, the remote stuff, we're going to change a little bit of stuff there, so I'm not going to provide instructions right now, but um, I'll put that in the comments or something um, later once we get that all sorted out. So kind of a fun little fun little demo. And I'm going to actually close this machine so it's not uh, running in the background. Come on, go away. All right. So yeah, good question, Micah, though. That is... Um, that's a big interesting part of it is you can run elementary OS apps on um, different versions of elementary OS and you don't necessarily have to recompile them. Now, of course, when a new OS release comes out, there are new API updates, there's new features in the operating system. Um, so there's still an incentive to update your apps. Uh, again, think to the mobile apps ecosystem. When uh, I a new version of iOS comes out with a new design and you run, like let's say when iOS 7 came out with their new flat design um, and you ran an iOS 6 app on that, it was like super out of place and looked super weird, but it worked. Um, that's kind of the same situation we're finding ourselves in here. It's like, you can still run an elementary OS 6 app on elementary OS 7. Uh, it's gonna look like an elementary OS 6 app. It won't be able to access the elementary OS 7 features if there's new features, but it'll still at least run. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's really an interesting um, thing there. And all right, let's see. Somebody's asking, um, do flat packs automatically update? No. Um, so that's something that was pretty controversial about Snap was by default, it just auto updates in the background without really asking the user. Um, with flat pack, uh, GNOME software, which is like their app store, um, GNOME software implements auto updating for flat packs, I believe. Um, I don't know if it's default or opt in or what. Um, app Center doesn't currently do auto updates for flat packs. Uh, that's probably a feature we will add. Um, but we'll make sure it's intelligent about uh, if you're on metered data or you can say you're on metered data or you can turn off the auto update feature. Um, updating flat packs is much safer than updating Debian packages though, uh, because basically it downloads that diff update and then it installs and makes sure it installs correctly before it switches over to it. Um, so if it doesn't install correctly, you're not left in a broken state. Um, so if you know you pulled out your ethernet cord or turned off your computer or your laptop died or whatever in the middle of an update, it's fine. You just, you just, don't get the update um, and it can continue then later. So auto updates are 
Um, very convenient and also very um, much, much safer on Flatpak. But they don't do it by de like they don't do it out of the box. The uh, App Store has to implement that, and that's probably something we'll look at. All right, let's see. Somebody's asking, is there a plan to deprecate apt? Um, sort of, um, from the elementary perspective. Um, under the hood for the foreseeable future, apt is still a thing. You still apt get install or apt install anything from the Ubuntu repos. Um, but it's definitely not, um, it's not how we plan to distribute our apps. Well, okay. There are like core, core components of the operating system, like the, the dock and the panel, uh, and the settings app that are, they wouldn't really work in a flat pack. I mean, just looking at like the system information here, like flat packs don't necessarily have an access to all the same information. Um, flat packs can't just like talk to your firmware without special permissions or whatever. Um, and your displays and all these settings like flat packs can't just change all these settings so it wouldn't make sense to flat pack the system settings app so that for elementary os6 will still be distributed over apt um and apt is still a thing for like the operating system and then yeah if you manually install something from a terminal or whatever um, you can still do that that's fine um but the plan is that we won't be using apt for uh third-party apps for app center anymore and then, yeah, long-term future, if we do, like, an image-based OS, apt would probably not exist, or it would probably work differently. That's a little more up in the air. A lot of talking today. Sorry. It's just lots to talk about, I guess, the App Center stuff, or Flatpak stuff. Um, somebody's asking about, like, NVIDIA drivers. Um yeah, that drivers and stuff still make sense to be either included in the operating system itself, or if it's a third-party driver... Um, yeah, it could be included via apt or, or whatever that, that stuff's not changing. Um, flat packs are really designed. I mean, technically you can flat pack command line apps, I think. Um, but they're really designed for GUI apps for graphical user interface, um, apps that have an icon and you click icon and it opens a window, that sort of app. Um, outside of that, um, things would probably still be apt based or compiled or whatever. Um, let's see. Somebody's asking if flat packs don't have auto update, which is good. Does it notify you of an update? Yep. Updates come through just like you would expect, um, today on elementary OS five, they come through app center. In fact, here it's saying I've got updates. Um, I've got an update to granite. I've got updates to, well, this is none of this is flat pack stuff, but yeah, they show up here alongside. I mean, this is, you're seeing some flat hub apps here. Those are flat packs. So updates show up here as you'd expect. And you get the same notification badge and, and notification and everything. Let's see. What else we got here? Yeah, Micah says, uh, it'll be nice not to have to rebuild the catalog of apps after every major release. And app developers can update at their own pace while still being able to be used. Exactly. Yes, that's a huge, huge advantage. Um, when we went from elementary OS 0 0.4, where we introduced App Center, to elementary OS 5, uh, which was the first release that came with App Center, uh, it came as an update to elementary s4 and then it came included in elementary s5 um yeah big issue is that all of the apps that came out on elementary s 0.4 had to be rebuilt and so day one on elementary s5 there were fewer apps than on elementary s 0.4 um that will be going away in the future from elementary s6 and beyond um yeah yeah it's a huge huge advantage for us Let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, somebody said, um, I have a friend who's that's dyslexic uh, watching. Can you please demonstrate dyslexic support to him? Yes, sure. Um, it's a, a feature that was added, let's see, in the desktop settings under appearance. There's this dyslexia friendly text uh, and it switches to using the open dyslexic typeface and you can also increase or decrease the font size depending on your preferences there. Um, that increases or decreases the interface size as well. So, um, you know, I'm not personally dyslexic, so to me, this doesn't really change anything for me. Um, it just looks different. But the idea is that the, the I guess the theory and, and some of the research is that the bottom heavy shapes and increased spacing between characters helps improve the legibility uh, and reading speed for dyslexic users. So, um, 
I think it's one of those things where it doesn't necessarily help everybody, but you know, if we can help some users um, with that feature, then it, it's definitely worth having. And that was, it was a feature, I believe it was proposed by um, somebody on our issue tracker who had dyslexia and pointed out the font for us. And we said, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an easy accessibility feature just to add as a standard feature. Thanks. Great question. Uh, da, 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 da. Are Flatpak applications integrated into the application launcher? Do they get desktop icons? Yeah, or icons of desktop entries? Yeah, yeah, they're it's indistinguishable from an app-based app as far as that goes. Um, again, on actually, um, web right here is a Flatpak, um, and it's you know showing up in. Oh, I'm going to turn the dyslexia font off because I don't need it. I'm going to leave the font on large though for ease of uh, reading. But yeah. Um, Web here is a flat pack and it shows up here as web. And um, I think this color picker is a flat pack. Calculator is a flat pack on here as well. So this is running the flat pack version. Um, it shows up and behaves exactly as you'd expect. There's there's no difference as far as the user experience there. Um, let's see. Do you see a future in which uh, you'll be able to launch command line apps with flat packs or this isn't the focus of them. I kind of touched on that. Uh, as far as I understand it um, from talking with people who work on flat pack, that's not really the focus, but it's, I don't think it's theoretically impossible um, for app center. We're focusing f just completely on GUI apps. Um, if you want to do command line stuff, there's other ways to do that. Other package managers and things. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's theory. You can launch flat pack apps from the command line. I mean, that's again, you can do like, Flatpak run calculator, and there's no reason this couldn't just output something in the terminal instead of opening a window. Um, but we're we're using it for GUI apps. Uh, Wayland progress. I'm not as familiar with that work, uh, but there is an open project board. Uh, let's go back. Yeah, let's go back here, and then. Uh, Oops, 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 helps if I actually erase what I tried to erase. So yeah, there's a Wayland project. It's um, github.com slash orgs slash elementary slash projects slash 12. Um, or just go to the GitHub org and browse that way. Um, but yeah, you can see there's a handful of things that have been done here. There's a handful of things to still be done. Um, and then there's some documentation about actually how to experiment with this work. So I know David Hewitt's been working on this. There's been a couple other people working on it. Um, my understanding is Gala works with Wayland with a few issues. Gala is the window manager that like does the multitasking and the window overviews and all this stuff. Oh, hey, there's my Plex server running. Neat. Let's close that. <laughs> um, yeah, it shows the, the overview in the windows and window management and everything. Um, I believe wing panel mostly works or, or does work with Wayland. I think the one major blocker is the dock. Um, cause it uses some X specific stuff for window management. Um, and a big part of that is probably going to be rethinking exactly how we want the dock to look and work. Um, and then building a Wayland, um, compatible dock. So that's future work, but that's, um, going to come down eventually. All right, let's see. So somebody's asking about high DPI support, fractional scaling. Um, yeah, so, um, I'm not on a high DPI machine here for the stream, um, but you can see the text size is actually a good demo of that. Um, so here's a couple apps open. Um, you go to appearance and you have the def default size. And you see instead of just increasing the text size, it also increases the things like buttons and switches. Um, they get bigger, these radio buttons get bigger. Um, and the border radii of things get bigger. So this is kind of in between um, a fractional scaling while still ensuring that like one pixel lines still take up one pixel or two pixels on high DPI. So everything stays really crisp, but things can scale um, at your preference for the, for the size. So combining this with high DPI support in the display settings, um, I'm not going to touch this because I am mirroring my display to the capture card, but yeah, you have scaling support here, which just does still integer scaling one X, two X, three X, depending on your resolution. Um, you combining those two, you can kind of get, um, you could run at two X with smaller text 
to get uh, more real estate. Um, you can fit a lot more on the screen, or you could run at 1x with larger text for like a 1.5x scaling. It just depends on your hardware and stuff. So um, we get, kind of give you the tools to do that. It's not the traditional um, fractional scaling where it renders the whole desktop at like three times the size and then scales it down to one and a half times, which is what other desktops do. Um, that introduces blurriness and a lot of computational overhead, especially um, on like integrated graphics. So we don't do that, um, but this is kind of a, a middle ground. Uh, in the future, when we're on Wayland, um, we may introduce that as like an optional thing, um, like you know, true non-integer scaling that gives you the blurriness, but at least works on more hardware. Um, but that's a little farther out. Good questions, everybody. I'm asking them so fast, I can't even keep up. Um, let's see. Is there any wallpapers that change dynamically? I saw some on Zorin OS. Um, not yet. No, I guess is my answer. Um, that's not a thing yet. Um, theoretically, it's possible. We'd have to do some work on um, a few things. Yeah. Um, I know GNOME has this feature, sort of. It, it doesn't do like... Um, it doesn't do based on your system style because they don't have like a system light or dark style, but the, it does it based on the time of day. And I think that theoretically works on elementary OS because we use the same like GNOME wallpaper format or whatever. Um, it's like an XML file or something. Um, nobody has created that sort of wallpaper for elementary OS yet. I'm, I think if you install a third party one, it would work. Um, something we are working on is, I don't think I have this enabled though. No, I don't. Dang not going to demo it right now but something we are working on is um, per wallpaper accent colors so there will be an addition to this accent color here that says you know automatic based on wallpaper or something so if you choose this you know yellow flower wallpaper you'll get yellow accent colors if you chose this green wallpaper you'd get green accent colors um, so for the pre-installed wallpapers we would choose those colors ahead of time to make sure that they're you know what's aesthetically pleasing like this wallpaper is technically more blue than yellow, but yellow is kind of the accent, so we would choose yellow. Um, and then it would fall back, if you add your own wallpaper, it would fall back to an algorithm that tries to pick out the, the dominant bright color um, and the one that's closest to any of these colors and then set that as your accent. And where you can just choose your own accent color and just go with that. So that's kind of a cool thing, not quite dynamic wallpapers. Um, we've been talking to people and looking at dynamic wallpapers. I don't think it'll ship for the 6.0 release maybe, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, if somebody wants to contribute that on the technical side, that would be awesome. Oh my, so much chat, so much chat. Um, uh, are there plans for integrating some sort of emoji picker? Um, yeah, if you just do a control dot, it pulls up your emoji picker in any text entry. Um, so that's... That's a thing already. That was a thing on Elementary OS 5. That's uh, built into GTK itself. So, yeah, there's emoji. Um, I also have a third-party app in App Center called Ideogram, which basically shows the emoji picker system-wide. So if you're using a non-GTK, non-native or GTK, non-native or non-GTK app um, that doesn't include its own emoji picker, you can do a system shortcut to pull up an emoji picker, and it'll like paste it in. It's a little less integrated, but yeah, it's built into GTK. You can just control dot and, uh, or right click and say insert emoji and it shows up. What about people with high DPI and low DPI monitors on one machine? So yeah, mixed DPI. So we call that, um, that's not really solved in, um, elementary OS six by default there. There's easy workarounds you can do. Um, and I have some open issues where we could sort of work around it sort of automatically and it would be okay. Um, but really that's not going to be like truly solved until Wayland. So that Wayland project board that we talked about earlier, um, that would be a place to kind of follow up on that work. Um, so we talking about new notifications in elementary OS six. Um, uh, the third party themes and stuff. Yeah, I don't know if you haven't seen, um, here's notifications in elementary OS 6. Um, I'm using a touchpad or trackpad on my laptop to swipe. Um, if you use a, a like a mouse mouse, you can you know, scroll and you can hit the little X button there. 
um, yeah, they're really nice. They they feel a lot more like um, the notification bubbles built into the notification center here. So I'm really excited about those. I, I love I love the swipe away. Oh, it's so good. Um, yeah, that's good. Good stuff. Uh, people are asking questions that have already been answered. Um, somebody's asking, doesn't using light mode hurt your eyes? Um, no, I'm in a very bright environment right now. Um, if it was at nighttime, I would definitely switch over to the dark style um, or you know set it to just do, do it at night or whatever um, with probably a dark wallpaper. But... Um, no, generally during the day I run light style, but if you prefer a dark style, you can you can set that and use it yourself. So that's a big feature coming to Elementary 06. We've got a blog post about that. Uh, it's on the homepage at blog.elementary.io. Um, somebody's asking, how do I contribute to the OS? I could do a whole stream about that, but um, a good place to get started is on elementary elementary.io. There is a getting started or get involved page. Um, kind of goes over the different ways you can contribute. So if you have a certain area of expertise, you can go here. If you're a web developer, you can click down to look at the web stuff. Um, yeah. Um, and if you're already d diving into desktop development, our um, docs at docs.elementary.io kind of walk you through how to get started developing an app um, that's designed for elementary OS. Um, we have updated this with Flatpak stuff now so um you'll be ready for elementary 06 and app center on elementary 06 um yeah the, the best place to start is definitely this get involved page it tells you all the different ways you can kind of get started um we do everything publicly on github so that's another place if you're familiar with github already you can just go to github.com slash elementary and um you know look around for something interesting there the project boards are definitely um you know, and easier, it's sorted by topic instead of just what component you're looking at. So if you're interested in Raspberry Pi stuff, you could take a look there. If you're interested in NVIDIA stuff or style sheet stuff. So there's kind of all sorts of places to, to get involved, but the, uh, the get involved place is a good place to start. Um, somebody's spamming the chat. Thanks for that. Um, somebody's asking about system tray. No, there's a whole thing about this. If you go to um, is Linux about dot X, Y, Z. This is a, a little compilation of resources that some people have put together, including myself. But um, yeah, there's a whole, there's um, some talks and blog posts from multiple projects across the ecosystem and then talking about the alternatives. So this gets back to that Flatpak um, portals API. So without getting into a whole soapbox discussion, um, indicator icon system tray things are a very old concept, literally from 1995. Um, and since 1995, believe it or not, we've invented better things and better user experiences and better APIs. Um, and that's what these APIs are. And they'll show you how things are supported across different desktops and, um, there's probably a lot more that could be added here too, but usually when it's a system tray is, you know, what somebody wants, they, they actually want a way to make sure their files are synced between their devices. And there's the cloud providers API for that, or they want a way to quickly perform actions. And there's the desktop actions API for that, or they want a way to, um, yeah, communicate long running background processes. And there's the launcher entry API for that, or they want a way to quickly, uh, get to their music player, and there's the Empress API for that. So there's all these better APIs that actually are more um, use-oriented instead of just like show an icon. Um, they're also much more accessible to um, users that need you know different accessibility needs. So, yep, there's a whole thing. Dan gave a good talk. It's linked right here at the top of this page as well. So let's see here. What else? What else? What else? Any way to adjust the line height in the elementary terminal? Um, not that I know of. Um, file an issue. That'd be great. GitHub.com slash elementary slash terminal. Um, you can change the text size really easily. There's just a button right here to boop, 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 boop. Um, but uh, line height, uh, I think, is just set according to the font size. So if that's a specific accessibility need you have, um, yeah, file an issue. We'll take a look at it. Um, yeah, somebody's talking about Kelly. Hi, Kelly, by the way. 
Um, taking a look at the bite size issues is uh, a good way to jump in if you're familiar with GitHub. Um, there's, do we have those listed somewhere? I think they're on the org. I'm not sure. But yeah, anytime you look at a, um, a repository on GitHub, if you look at the issues, and then if you find any that say, of course there's not any here. Can I say label? Oh my gosh, label byte size? No, nope. I'm not sure. I think we linked to them on the Get Involved page though. Yeah, byte size issues, here we go. So on the desktop, invi in, uh, desktop development oops, page, we have a link to byte size issues. So this will show you across the whole elementary um, organization, all issues that we've said, yeah, these should be re relatively simple to implement or review, and um, we just haven't gotten to them yet. So it's a good place to jump in. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Somebody's asking, um, as, flat as the Flatpak work advances, um, are and we're getting even more independent from the Debian ecosystem, do we plan to move out from Ubuntu? I think I kind of covered that earlier in the stream. So um, if you rewind, like, probably like 20, 30 minutes, <laughs> somebody asked, um, if Ubuntu were to disappear tomorrow, what would we do? It's kind of the same answer. Um, no, Ubuntu does great work on the kernel and security side of things and hardware compatibility. Um, they build a, a really great base for us to build on top of. So there's no um, real reason to, to move away from that. If we did do an image-based operating system in the future, it would probably still be um, built from an Ubuntu base. It would just be uh, an image built on that, if that makes sense. Um, somebody's asking if there's a torrent of Elementary OS 6. No, but there's something even better. There's hosted downloads at builds.elementary.io um, where you can get your own, very own copy uh, all you have to do is be a GitHub sponsor. But when the public beta releases, which is very soon, uh, it is going to be a public beta, which means anybody can just download it. Um, I don't know why this build site is not loading. It might be because my internet is like crapping out or something. But uh, yeah, builds.elementary.io. Theoretically, if this site was loading, maybe it's because they're working on getting beta builds up or something. But um, yeah, you can get your own builds that are officially built by us and guaranteed to, you know, at least be coming from us. They have a, a hash check and everything there. So, yeah, definitely do that. It also helps support us if you um, are getting early access. You also get access to experimental builds to things like Pinebook Pro and Raspberry Pi 4. Um, so, yeah, all sorts of goodies there. And we occasionally send out um, updates to our backers, um, previews of things. So, yeah. Sponsor us. Um, somebody's asking about multi-monitor support. Um, so actually we had a big update in elementary OS 5.1 that improved multi-monitors um, with the panel. Um, again, with the exception of the uh, mixed DPI stuff, which you can manually work around, but uh, multi-monitor support in general is is a lot, um, is really good, I guess. Uh, we're still limited by Mutter uh, with the whole workspaces on one display thing. Um, I have a feeling that's going to be fixed sometime. Probably not for the launch of Elementary OS 6, but we're definitely um, following along with GNOME and Mutter's development there. Somebody said builds works over here, just FYI. Yeah, I, I, something's weird with my computer. Occasionally the network drops out, especially when I'm like capping out my upload bandwidth. Um, so sometimes things just don't load. Yeah, I think that's all the questions. And I did my demo. Let me look at my notes here. Got to wake up my little tablet again, sorry. Um, oh, this is just a point that I missed talking about earlier. Um, another interesting implication of the elementary OS um, Elementary OS 6 flat packs running on Elementary OS 5 thing is that, um, you know, if you're not comfortable running a an in-development or beta class operating system on your main machine, but you still want to develop apps for Elementary OS 6, you can actually do that now. So um, because we're 
all app center apps will be built in Flatpak. Um, this I'm on my screen now is elementary OS five. Um, uh, where is it? We changed the name of this. Yeah. Look on the, um, system information. I'm on elementary OS five here in this virtual machine and you can run elementary OS six flat packs, which means you can develop elementary OS six flat packs. So, um, you could build your app center app. That'll be ready for elementary OS six on launch day without having to run elementary OS six, um, on your main operating system. So that's kind of a really interesting implication. Um, you know, we're seeing similar things in the GNOME world where people are able to use GTK4 before their whole desktop switches to GTK4, and we expect similar um, things to be possible here. So yeah, the the elementary um, development docs have been updated for Flatpak now, so you can actually start building your apps for elementary OS 6 on elementary OS 5. Somebody's asking why Ubuntu 20.04 and not 21.04. So we always build off the LTS. Um, Ubuntu supports the LTS releases for, I think it's five years with standard updates after the release. Um, we have a page on the wiki. Elementary, oh my goodness, elementary OS. I'm learning with this new microphone right here. I can't see my keyboard and apparently I look at my keyboard when I'm typing on a stream. Um, yeah, because I gotta kind of reach around the keyboard or the microphone. Anyway, uh, on the Elementary OS Wiki, there is really upgrades page here, and we talk about the support cycle. So uh, we always build on the LTS releases because they have a much much longer support cycle. Um, so we come out with a new operating system about every two years or so, give or take. Especially when there's global pandemics, sometimes take a, takes a little longer. But the nice thing is um, that core bit of the operating system, all the libraries are going to be supported and updated through um, at least April 2025. So whereas 2104 won't, will only be supported for like a year, I think. Um, also, my light just died because it's battery powered, apparently. So uh, <laughs> it's been an hour that it's been on. So yeah, it lasts an hour. So yeah, I think I'm going to start wrapping up. Uh, any last minute questions or any last minute demos of things you want to see on Elementary OS 6 while we're here? Uh, give me a shout out in the chat and we will take a look at that. Let's, uh, what is going on here? Sorry, I'm going to close this, uh, close this VM again. VirtualBox is, um, I'm just familiar with it. I haven't used GNOME boxes as much for virtual machines, but it does weird things with window management. It doesn't like going full screen and changing desktops and stuff. So get rid of that. So what else we got here? Um... Oh yeah, nine months. Yeah, it's not even supported for a whole year. It's maintained for I think nine months. Um, yep, 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 yep. Fun fact. Uh, oh, somebody's asking about Flutter. Um, no. <laughs> um, again, third-party apps can be built in whatever language they want. Um, but if they're going to be released on App Center, they have to be GTK apps because they support features like we saw with uh, the dark style and um, the accent color and text size and dyslexia friendly text. So um, we require all third party apps that aren't like games, but the apps that have a UI uh, be built with GTK. Um, if somebody builds an app on for using Flutter or any other toolkit and puts it on FlatHub, you can easily go install that from FlatHub and it you know sideloads um, that, that's simple enough to do, but we won't be hosting those in App Center. Um, somebody's can I, saying, can I demo the new online account support? So I don't think I actually have that work in progress branch installed locally, and I'm not gonna bore you with trying to compile it, but um, it will look and work like this, where you can add an IMAP account here, and then it will show up. I'm not gonna actually open my mail because I don't know what's in there. If it's private, same with my calendar. I don't have a like demo friendly calendar account added. Um, and I don't need everybody in the world seeing what I'm doing, but yeah, you add, add an account here and it will um, show up in those apps. And if you go into those apps and you're not signed into an account, it'll have a button that opens up system settings for you there. Um, I don't have that work in progress stuff installed, so it's not um, working here, but that's, I, do, I don't think that's going to be done for the beta. Um, so you'll still have to do the kind of weird workaround where you install evolution from the Ubuntu repos and then sign in there um, so that it sets it up with the evolution data center uh, data service uh, and then our mail app and contacts and calendar and everything can talk to that um, 
but yeah, for the final release, that's definitely there's definitely work that still has to be done, and that's on the um, project board as well. Let's see. Somebody's asking, so if you want to use Python, install a library like NumPy, does Flatback, Flatpak sandboxing allow you to use this library? Um, I'm not a Python developer, so I'm not as familiar with that ecosystem. But I think the case there would be that you would install that dependency in your Flatpak um, app. It wouldn't be running at a system level. It would be running inside the sandbox. So yeah, you can still use, you can still install and use things like that inside your sandbox. Um, and that's where the deduplication is nifty. If you know there's another app that also uses the same library or any of the same files, it will deduplicate those. So you're only actually saving one copy, um, even though they're inside the sandbox, if that makes sense. And it does. it's like a binary diff. So if the binary file matches, it will be duplicate, deduplicated um, and just reference the existing one on disk. Um, yeah. I think that about covers it. There's probably a bunch of stuff I missed, um, but there was a lot and I've talked for like two hours straight now. So <laughs> hopefully that gives you a little bit of an update on uh, Flatpak on Elementary OS 6 and we're, we're very close to the beta now where that's uh, we're sprinting definitely to get that work done as soon as possible and uh, get this beta out publicly for everyone to, to test and play with and try on their hardware, try the new installer, try the new um, system settings, preferences and stuff. Uh, it's very exciting. So we're close. We're so close. <laughs> Not giving a date because we don't have a date, but uh, project board um, on uh, wherever it was on the elementary GitHub account. And uh, it will give you a good sense of when we're when releasing that beta. And of course, we'll write a blog post. Um, I've already started work on the blog post, but um, we'll release that and we'll we'll shout it from from the social media rooftops and everything, of course. So yeah, we're getting close. It's exciting. All right, with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Thanks for joining the stream. Um, thanks for for bearing with the uh, kind of all over the place <laughs> question and answer and demos and uh, virtual machine weirdness and me interrupting myself by taking a drink of water. Um, appreciate you joining. Keep your eye on our social media, twitter.com slash elementary. Um, mastodon.social slash elementary I believe um, all those links are at elementary.io in the top right of the webpage there so yeah thanks for tuning in talk to you all later